Hey guys, in this video, we're going to learn all about loops and how to use them. So what are loops? Well, loops are certain structures that allow us to repeat a certain number of processes until a condition is true. Now, I know this sounds a little cryptic, so let's break it down with a simple example. Let's say you walk into Starbucks and you want to order a drink. Now, you will go up to the barista, you will place your order, make the payment. Then, the barista will read what you want. I mean, it's usually written on the cup over there. They will make your drink. And finally, they will serve you your drink. So these five steps are repeated for every single customer. So, I mean, in other words, it's kind of like a loop because these five steps are repeated until a condition is true. And in this case, the condition that we're talking about is until every customer has a drink. So until every customer has a drink, this process is repeated in the coffee shop just again and again and again and again. And it's a loop. And that's kind of how loops work in programming. Uh, another example of how loops are there in our daily lives is um, in school. So we've all been to school. And as you may know already, in school, we have three to four blocks of different classes each day from Monday to Friday. Now, traditional school calendars say that on Monday, you will have certain lectures, Tuesday, you'll have certain lectures, so on and so forth until Friday. Then once you reach the last block on Friday, you go back to Monday and you start all over again. So the classes that you have are in a loop, right? Because you may have biology first on the Monday morning and you may have physics last on a Friday afternoon. So this will stay constant. It's just that you will be iterating over this loop as many times as you need to until school is over and you'll have summer. So this is how loops work in programming. So to reiterate, in programming, a loop is a structure which allows us to repeat a certain number of processes until a certain condition is true. So now, why would we want to use loops in programming? Well, what if I want to print the first 20 numbers in the number sequence? I could write print 1, print 2, print 3, print 4, print 5, so on and so forth. But that could get really messy and tedious. And to be honest, that's just bad programming. And what if the number was larger? What if I need to print a thousand numbers? I wouldn't want to write the print statement a thousand times, right? So... This is where loops come in because they make our lives a whole lot easier and they allow us to repeat the certain process, which is printing a number, as many times as we need to. Now, before I get started on how exactly loops are written and how to use them in programming, it's important to remember that there are two main types of loops in Python. There are for loops and there are while loops. For loops are used when the number of repetitions is known or fixed. However, while loops are used when the number of repetitions is not known or fixed, but rather until a condition is true. So now let's switch to my computer screen and I will explain this using programming. So let's take the example that I want to print the first five numbers of the number sequence. Now because I know that the number of repetitions is five, I should use a for loop. But how do we write a for loop? Well first we write the word for, followed by a variable of our choice. So the variable can be named anything that has not already been declared. So I'm going to call it counter. Then we assign the va variable some values using the operator in. So in. And because we want to assign more than one value to the variable counter, we can use the range function. So I'll explain how this function works in a bit, but for now, I'm just going to go ahead and type the range function. 
So now after the range function, we have to put a semicolon. And this is the header of our loop. Now the word for over here is a keyword that tells the computer that this is a for loop structure. Now, because loops have to be repeated until a certain condition is true, the rest of the loop for loop header, which is this part, is actually the condition for which the loop will execute and will terminate when this condition is no longer true. So this condition looks a little cryptic at first glance because we don't know what it is saying. But if you recall, a condition involves a variable, an operator, and a value to compare to. So our variable is counter. Keep in mind that the variable could be named absolutely anything, but has to be unique and not repeated elsewhere in the program. And now you may be wondering, okay, that's the variable, but where is the operator? Well, the word in is the operator. It's a membership operator. And what that basically means is that if the counter's value is in the range provided by the range function, then the condition is true. The in operator is the only operator that is ever used in the for loop. So now the range function. The range function allows us to input one, two, or three numbers as parameters. So these numbers in the brackets or parentheses are parameters. Right now I've provided two parameters, but let's say I provide one more. So the first number is the starting value and it is included in the range. The second number is the end value and it is not included in the range. And lastly, the third value tells the computer by how much to increment its counter or variable or value each time a repetition of the loop is completed. Now, uh, a range function basically takes in certain parameters and it returns a range specified by those parameters. So if one number is provided, the starting value will be its default value of zero. So this range will start at zero. And the end value will be what is given. So it will end at 5, but technically end at 4 because 5 is not included in the range. Then, uh, and the step, which is the third variable that we usually provide, or the third parameter that we usually provide, will be set to its default value of 1. So each time the range will increment, the value in the range will increment by 1. Now if two numbers are provided, so if I provide 1 comma 6, the first value is the starting value of the range, and the second value is the ending value of the range. And the third parameter, which is usually the step, is set to its default value of 1. And obviously if we provide a third parameter, so 1, we can, it will be the step that you provide. However, in this scenario, we don't need to provide a third parameter because anyways, our step is one. So I can just go ahead and delete this. And I want to provide a first one because I want to start from one. I don't want to start from zero. So if I were to leave this from zero to six, then it, the numbers that would be printed would be zero, one, two, three, four, five. But I want to print from one. So I'm going to give the parameter as one. Now, whatever we write on the next couple of lines, we have to indent so that the computer recognizes it as the body of the for loop and will repeat the process that is followed after the for loop header. So I am simply going to print the value of the variable counter in each repetition to see how it increments. But before running this program, let's take a look at a visual representation of this for loop to make it simpler to understand. So over here, I have a flowchart that shows the same program that we wrote earlier, but in a diagrammatical, diagrammatical representation. So first, the, the program starts 
and we initialize counter to 1. Then the condition is checked. Is the counter greater than 5? And since the answer is no, the counter is printed. Now, after the counter is printed, it increments by 1, and it now holds the value 2, and it's once again checked, is it greater than 5? Now, it's still not greater than 5, so the counter is printed again. Then, it's incremented again by 1 to become 3, and once again it is checked, is it greater than 5? Since it's not, the counter is printed, incremented by 1, and checked again. Now, it's still not greater, so the counter is printed once again, incremented once more, and checked again. Now, the counter is equal to 5. It's not greater than 5. So this condition is still false. So the, the counter is printed again, incremented by 1. And now the counter holds the value 6, which is greater than 5. So this condition is true. And the loop is exited and the program ends. So now that we've understood the elements of the for loop and how to write one, let's go ahead and run this program. So there you go. The first five numbers of the number sequence are printed in my terminal. Now let's take another example with for loops. Let's say I want to add all the multiples of 2 starting from 2 up till 20. First, I will declare a variable called sum and I will initialize it to 0. Now, if you've noticed, sum seems to be a keyword somewhere. So, it might be better to use another name, such as total. Now, because total is not highlighted in any way, I can tell that it doesn't mean anything. So, I've initialized a variable named total, and this variable will hold the total of all the numbers after I add them. Now I will go ahead and declare the for loop. So I will write for x in range 2 to 21. And I want to have a step of 2. And I'll put a semicolon. And after this, I will write total equals total plus x. And at the end of the loop, I will print the total. So now the reason that I started with 2 is because, as you may recall, I wanted to add up all the multiples of 2, starting from the number 2, ending at the number 20. Now again, I put 21 because remember, the second number is not included. The one below the last number is included in the range. So, therefore, I need to provide 21 and not 20. And lastly, this is the step. Because I want all even numbers, our step has to be 2. Because then I will get 2, 4, 6, 8, so on and so forth. So, let's go ahead and run this program. And there you go. That's the sum, 110. So, before I move on to while loops, let's take one last example that is actually very useful. And this is the isPrime function. Uh, so the isPrime function requires the use of for loops. And what it does is that it checks if a given number is a prime number. So how would this algorithm work? Well, to understand how to write the algorithm, we have to know what, the prime, what a prime number is. So let's take the example. Let's say our number is 17. Now you and I both know that this is a prime number, and I've taken a smaller number just for starters, but what if the number was something like this? Now you don't know if it's a prime number or not. So that's why we are going to use the isPrime function. So I'm going to go back to the number 17, and well firstly, we know that prime numbers are numbers that are only divisible by 1 and itself. 
So although I cannot go ahead and actually write the um, condition saying it should only be divisible by one in itself, I can do the opposite mm. where I check if it's divisible by any other number than one and itself. So first, I would see uh, if the number is one or zero because those are special numbers that are not prime. So if num is less than two, then print num not prime. Now, that's the first part that we do. Now, the second condition is that if a number is two, it's even, but it's prime. So two is actually a really special prime number because it's even and it's a prime number. So we need to have a separate condition just for the number two. So if num is equal to two, then print num is prime. And now, we know that if a number is divisible by 2, then it's definitely not a prime number because it's an even number. So what we can do is we can say if num mod 2 equals 0, so this means that when it's divided by 2, its remainder is 0, print num not prime. I should probably add an is. But yeah, so this is how it works. So now we've checked if the number is a 1 or a 0, we've checked if it's 2, and we've checked if it's an even number. Now, these are the three basic conditions that a number may not be prime or is prime. But we also have to check for all the other odd numbers, such as 3, 5, 7, 11, so on and so forth. So how would we do this? I mean, I don't want to write an if condition for every single one of them, right? Up till the number. So I can use a for loop. And how this would work is I would say if num mod factor is equal to zero print num is not prime and then I want to exit the loop so I'm gonna say break and that's it and then at the end if the number survived all of these conditions that definitely means that it is a prime number so I'm gonna say print num is prime so I'm gonna explain what this for loop does so Basically, if the number passes these three if conditions or conditional statements, we still have to check if the number is divisible against every odd number out there. And the reason that we check every odd number and not just every number is because it's a waste of time to check for even numbers as factors of the number. For example, if the number was 32 instead of 17, I don't need to bother checking if it is divisible by 4 because the number 32 would not pass condition 3, as it's already divisible by 2. And this is similar with any other number that, that has an even factor, as it would not pass condition 3. Now, over here in the for loop, I have started at number 3 because I've already checked for numbers 0, 1, and 2, so I need to start at number 3. And I want to end one number just before the number 17. So I can just write num. I don't need to write num plus 1. If I write num plus 1, then at one point, factor will hold the value 17 
And this condition will become true and it will say it's not a prime, even though 17 really is a prime. So it has to be just num. And lastly, I, the step has to be 2. Well, that's because I don't want to check for even numbers. I only want to check for odd numbers. Now, inside the loop, I want to check if the number is divisible by the factor. So I will say num mod factor is equal to 0, and I'll make a condition. And if it is true, then I want to print that the number is not a prime because it has a factor that is not 1 or itself. And then I want to break out of this loop. So what break does is that it just terminates the loop. It means it'll just exit this loop that goes on and come to the next line over here. So the reason I want to do this is because if there's already one factor found, that obviously means it's not a prime. I don't need to check for more factors. So it's a waste of time. My algorithm will run for longer if I wait and run for all of the numbers in the range, even though I've already found one that the number is divisible by. Now, if the uh, number passes through all these four conditions and this loop, it clearly means that it is a prime number because we've checked for all the conditions that make a number a prime number. Or in this case, make a number not a prime number. And so at the end, we can print num is prime. Now let's go ahead and run this and see if it works. There you go. 17 is prime. Now let's try a bigger number. I'm making a number up and I have no clue if this will be a prime number or not, but we can see. Ah, here we've encountered an error. So the error over here is that it's not a prime number because it did not pass this condition or it did not pass this condition. Sorry, my bad. It did not pass this condition. But I still wrote this print statement at the end. So this print statement will print regardless of whether it's a prime number or not. So this is a bug on my side. So to fix this, I would probably need to have a, con a variable that holds the condition of whether it is a prime number or not. So how this would work is I would say is prime equals false. Then I would say is prime equals false. Then over here I would say is prime equals true. Then over here I would say is prime equals false. And now instead of printing what it is or what it isn't, I would just say is prime is equal to false. And I'm so sorry, I should have initialized this to true because we're trying to prove that the number is not a prime number. We're not trying to prove that it is, we're trying to prove that it's not. And if it passes the conditions, that means obviously it is. So over here, I would say if is prime is equal to, I don't even need to say that, I can just say if is prime, and I can say print num is prime, else print num is not prime. So now if I go ahead and run this, it should work. And there you go. It only prints the correct version, which is that it is not a prime. So this is how for loops work. But for loops are not particularly useful when we don't know the number of repetitions. In this case, we need to use a while loop. So let's say I have a number and I'm going to say that this number is 7, 8, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2. And I want to get the number's leftmost digit, or I want to get its first digit. So how would I do this? Well, I would keep dividing the number by 10, 
and I would only keep the quotient, or the left part. I wouldn't keep the decimal part. Until the quotient itself is less than 10. So in other words, my condition to enter the loop is quotient has to be greater than or equal to 10. So in order to write a while loop, I will first type the word while, and then I will follow this by my condition, which is num is greater than equal to 10. Then I will add a semicolon and indent the rest of my while loop body. I will use the flooring operator and type num equals num floored by 10. And this will keep num dividing the number itself by 10 until it's less than 10 itself, after which the loop will exit, like will exit the loop. And outside the loop, I can print the number. So while the number is greater than equal to 10, it means that I'm dealing with a number with more than one digit, and therefore I need to keep dividing till I reach the leftmost digit. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to print this and let's see how it turns out. And there you go, I got the leftmost digit, which is 7. So remember, while loops are used when we don't know the number of repetitions. Now, in this case, I can obviously count the number of digits there are and then use a for loop. But what if the user inputted this number and you didn't know what it was? Well, then you would have to use a while loop. Let's take one more example of how while loops can be used. Sometimes you might need an infinite loop, something that repeats forever until some input is correct. Let's take the example of a program that inputs the marks of children in a math exam from the teacher and averages them. Now, I don't know how many children there are, so in this case, I would use an infinite while loop. But before I declare a loop, I will need to initialize a variable that will hold the sum of all the marks. So total marks equals zero. And I will need to also initialize a variable counter that will keep track of the number of marks that are entered or the number of students that are there. So now, in order to declare an infinite while loop, we need to type the keyword while followed by the word true and then a semicolon. And that's it. That's how you declare an infinite loop. Now, inside I will get the user input like this. I will say marks is equal to input and then I can put in any prompt I want to put inside here. So I would say enter marks and then close. Now one problem with this is that input function returns a type string. We cannot um, execute addition, subtraction, and division on strings. So we can simply make this an integer by using the int function. So what this will do is it will turn whatever string is given into an integer, into a type integer. So this is how we're going to get the marks from the user. First, we're going to total the marks. So we're going to say total marks equals total plus marks and we're also going to increment our counter by one so counter equals counter plus one however this is really risky now if i go ahead and run this because this is an infinite loop it will literally run till infinity and it will never stop so we need to provide an exit condition so the exit condition will just be through a regular if statement and we'll say if marks are equal to a number that should be erroneous, perhaps minus one, then break. Now, 
Break is another keyword that can be used in loops. Break means that the computer can exit the loop completely and move on to the next line outside the loop, which would be over here as it is not indented. So now outside the loop, I will print the average by dividing the sum by the counter. So print average marks. Total divided by counter. And that's pretty much it. Like, that's how the code works. And the reason that I did not put the initialization of these variables inside the loop is because then I would only get a total of the last mark. Because each time I'd be setting the marks back to zero. So I want to always initialize outside a loop. And any calculations that I need from an entirety of the marks should be done out afterwards outside the while loop. So now if I go ahead and I run this, let's see if it works. So it says to enter marks. So I'll put a 90. Oops, wrong place. I'll put a 90. Then I'll put a 45, I'll put an 87, and a 65. And let's say I just want four marks. So I will click enter, and this time I'll put minus one. Oh, and now I have an error. Ah, over here, I used the wrong variable name. It should be total marks. So now if I go ahead and I rerun it, um, 90, uh, wrong place, sorry. 90, 45, 87, and 65. And now if I put minus 1, the average marks are 57.2. So this is how while loops work. Now I'm going to move on to nested for loops. So nested for loops are loops inside a loop. So how would I do this? Why would I even need one? Well, let's say I wanted to print this pattern. One asterisk on line one, two asterisk on line two, three on line three, four on line four, five on line five, and so on and so forth. Well, you're going to need to use a nested loop. So first, I would say, let's say I wanted to print five lines. So first, I would say for i in range or let's give this a more meaningful name, let's say for row in range 1 to 6, do something. Now, a nested loop is when I will declare a loop that is inside this loop. So if I indent and then I say for i in range row print asterisk end and then I go ahead and close this and print a new line. So I'm going to explain what this does. Just give me a minute. So now I know this looks really cryptic right now, but just bear with me. How this works is that the body, which is this part of the main loop, will be repeated five times because it's in range one to six. But inside the body, we have another for loop. So the print statement inside the second loop will be repeated row number of times. So when row is one, the print statement will be repeated once before row can become two. Now, after row becomes 2, the nested for loop will undergo two repetitions. So the inside print statement will be repeated twice before this nested loop ends and this line is run and we go back up and row becomes 3. And this will continue repeating until row reaches 6 and it terminates. This end part, I'm slightly new, but what it does is that it keeps the print cursor on the same line. 
because normally each print statement is one line. And after I have printed the correct number of asterisks in one line, I want to go to the next line so I have an empty print statement. So let's go ahead and run this and see what happens. There you go, we have the number pattern that we wanted. So this is it for loops. And I highly encourage you to go ahead and experiment with loops. See, play around with for loops, while loops, how to input stuff from the user, and playing around with number patterns. Perhaps you can try printing Pascal's triangle. So you should play around with this and see what all you can do. And again, it's okay if you come across some errors because that's very normal. You just need to have some patience. You need to Google the errors and you will definitely get it.